Okay. So what we were talking about when we left off last time was the action potential that's generated in other regions of the heart outside of the SA node. In the SA node, it's leaky to sodium, which accounts for the autorhythmicity of the heart. But as we move out of the heart, we lose that leakiness of sodium because we don't want other parts of the heart to be autorhythmic. Uh, and we add in this characteristic sort of plateau, which you can actually see really well in both the Purkinje fibers and the ventricles, but it's present here in the other parts of the heart as well. So what actually accounts for that plateau? So the plateau forms, and again, this is roughly right around 30 plus 30 millivolts. Uh, sodium channels are open, plus 30 millivolts. Sodium channels close down, but then we begin to form this plateau. So just kind of give me a little bit of a review here. What's happening when the sodium channels open up in the cardio, uh, membrane of the cardiomyocyte? What's happening with sodium? Sodium is rushing in, and what's the consequence on the charge of the intracellular fluid? It's increasing in charge. Sodium channels now close, but we're going to maintain that kind of plus 30 millivolt charge for a prolonged period of time, which we refer to as a plateau. So how does this plateau actually form? We have some channels that are called slow calcium channels that account for what's known as the slow calcium inundation. So these slow calcium channels prolong the deep polarization. Now, how is that actually going to work? And I want you to think about it, and then I'm going to give you the correct answer. I'm telling you that it's calcium that's, in involved, that's involved in maintaining the plateau. Does that make sense? And why does it make sense? Think back on your concentrations. Where is calcium the highest? Outside. Outside. And so if we have a calcium channel that opens up, calcium will begin to rush into the cell. Okay, so here is the physiological explanation <coughs> for why the, the, the plateau exists. So these slow calcium channels open at the same time as the sodium channels. but they open more slowly. So calcium channels are opening up. Sodium channels flip open, and sodium begins to rush in the cell immediately, accounting for that initial increase in voltage. Now someplace in here, as we get towards the peak of the action potential, calcium channels that have then slowly opening are finally going to be fully open, allowing permeation of calcium. So they're just opening, triggered to open at the same time, but the gate is a slower opening gate than the sodium channels. So calcium then begins to enter into the cell. And that certainly accounts for the peak, but we have this other little kind of notch here on all of these all of these figures. And so we got to account for that as well. Now, I've just dumped a whole bunch of sodium into the cell to account for this. Now calcium is going to begin to rush into the cell as well. I have a short little drop. That's what's represented here on each of these figures is a short little drop in voltage and then the plateau forms and then it begins to drop off. So what, what would be an explanation for this in terms of charge? If we're losing some of our intracellular fluid charge, what's happening here? Okay, so it's definitely potassium, which is great that you're catching on here. Potassium is going to be moving out. Now, in reality, what is happening is because I've just loaded up the cell with positive charges, 
the inside of the cells become more positive. What's the charge on potassium? Potassium is positive. Do positive things like to be near each other? No. And so we're actually going to begin to repel the potassium just a little bit. And so we get this small little potassium leak through the membrane. And as that potassium leaks through the membrane, we're going to have this slight drop during the plateau. Now, if you look at this, you'll notice that the plateau is actually a little bit different in each of these different tissue examples. So we have that drop, and then it actually continues. The, the plateau here, it's... <coughs> It, it still exists in the atria, but then it, it, it drops off. But the plateau is not completely flat. It doesn't look like this. Rather, it's more of a just slightly sloped plateau. Down here, the plateau is a little more pronounced. Down here in the ventricles and in the Purkinje network, the plateau is really pronounced. So we're going to have this leakiness, and this accounts for that initial drop, but also it accounts for some of the drop in these other plateaus. So the atria, the bundle of Hiss, are slightly more leaky to potassium as it's dripped out of the cell membrane. All right, so we've accounted for the plateau now. It's kind of this dynamic with calcium and then the repulsion of potassium at different levels out of these different tissues inside of the heart. These slow opening calcium channels, eventually they're going to close. And when they close, we no longer have the ability to send calcium into the cell, of calcium of cell, in cell. <laughs> there we go. No more calcium is going into the cell once the calcium channels are closed. We still have that potassium leakiness, but something else is going to happen here as well. Potassium channels are now actually going to open up. And we've already seen this before with the nervous system, that sodium channels opened at threshold, and then potassium channels were opening at nearly the highest peak on the action potential of the nerve. So potassium channels, which potassium is high inside of the cell, after the calcium channels have closed, after we've had that leakiness in the formation of the plateau, the potassium channels will open up. And, and really, it's the potassium channels are going to become fully open, and potassium is going to exit in a much higher rate outside of the cell. So it's leaking, then the potassium channels open, and now we're rushing out of the cell. It's not just a slow leak, it's now a rush out of the cell. And this is going to result in the rapid repolarization that we can observe. So here, sodium increases up, we have the potassium leakiness, and then potassium rushes out during repolarization. And you can see that in each of these examples as we go through uh, each of those tissues. So we have this rapid repolarization back down towards the resting membrane potential, and then we're going to have those <coughs> pump mechanisms to reverse the concentrations to, to put potassium uh, back into the cell in high concentrations and sodium and calcium outside of the cell in high concentrations. Okay, so basically what you're saying is once we reverted the charges, how did the charges go back to what we observed in resting membrane potential? Since we reverted the charges using different chemicals, I mean different elements in and out, how do they, what a charge to come back? Okay, well, we push the potassium back out of the calcium. There are pumps that are a potassium pump that's moving potassium back in against its concentration building. 
they're actually always on. It's like a, it, it's kind of like a faucet that you always have turned on. And then, so you always have the sink filling up with water. And then when a channel opens, it's going to allow concentration gradient to be the propellant for moving the, the charged particles across. It would be like coming in and taking a big bucket and scooping the sink out. You remove a bunch of stuff at, all at one time, but it slowly begins to leak back in. Does that make sense? Okay, we're going to move on and we're going to talk about actually taking these electrical signals that are the impetus to contract the muscle, and we're going to talk about how that contraction actually occurs in a cardiomyocyte. This should look vaguely familiar. Where have you seen a figure like this before? We have a T2 wheel here, sarcoplasmic reticulum, there's the ryanogene receptor. It's very similar to skeletal muscle. Okay. In fact, cardiomyocytes are also going to be striated because of the presence of things like the sarcomere, those organized actin and myosin filaments. So you really already know a lot about what's going to be happening here to make cardiomyocyte contract. So that's all I'm going to say. No, I'm just kidding. That's where I'm going to leave it. <laughs> that's not really where I'm going to leave it. Okay, the only difference is we don't have that nerve that's innervating the SA nerve. There's nerves that innervate the heart, but remember the SA nerve is autorhythmic. Okay, so this whole process is going to begin with changes in the electrical activity of the SA node and are going to be passed along the conduction system for all of the other cardiomyocytes in the heart to cause that rhythmic contraction. The action potential that's formed, this is happening up at the membrane because this is, I mean, we're dealing with that concentration of sodium and calcium and potassium on either side of the membrane. So the action potential is always near the membrane and it's going to permeate or spread or jump along the membrane. So the action potential that's formed spreads along the membrane. So once the action potential is generated, once we reach threshold, which in the SA node we're going to have leakiness of sodium. Sodium is just going to leak into the cell, and it's going to slowly bring up the voltage inside of the cell. Eventually we're going to get to a voltage, a threshold voltage, and then we're going to generate action potential along the membrane from that point of origin. So all of the things that we've just talked about are happening all along the membrane. And eventually we start going down into the T-tubule, into other parts of the tissue. We have sodium leaking out and then beginning to rush out. Potassium leaks, uh, I'm sorry, sodium rushes in, potassium leaks out just a little bit. Calcium begins to rush in and then potassium pours out to bring us back down. That's the action potential that's formed. That begins to happen over and over again in sequence as we move along the membrane and interact with all of those proteins. And eventually we're going to get down here into the T-tubule where we can interact with the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So when the action potential spreads along the membrane and reaches <coughs> the ryanidine receptor and basically is able to interact with the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the change in voltage brought by the action potential is going to result, that's supposed to be an O, it's going to result in voltage-gated slow calcium channels to open. So we have these slow-gated calcium channels that respond to the voltage that's being introduced by the formation of the action potential tracking along the membrane. 
Now, when this happens, because remember that the action potential, it's happening up here in just this fluid that's right next to the membrane. So those are where all the changes are happening. I'm going to have to get high levels of calcium inside of the whole cell where all of my sarcomere proteins are, are located. Does this make sense? Okay, so even though I have calcium rushing into the cell up here, we're not getting it deep enough and permeating it deep inside of the cell for it to be able to interact with the sarcomere. So this mechanism of another group of voltage-gated slow calcium channels opening up in response to those action potentials is going to be the impetus to increase the whole cellular content in terms of calcium. Now, initially, when we have these slow calcium channels open, we're just going to allow a small amount of calcium into the cell. And initially, that's just already what we've seen. This is already the calcium that we've seen as the action potential was formed. So we're going to have that small amount of calcium rush in from the extracellular fluid into the intracellular fluid as an action potential is formed in that fluid directly next to the membrane. We're going to see that here along this portion of the membrane. We're going to see it as we permeate that signal into the T-tubule as well. Now, with that small amount of calcium that comes in, that calcium is going to be able to bind and interact with our sarcoplasmic reticulum, our SR. Now, does anyone remember what our SR really was? Specialized version of the endoplasmic reticulum that we find in muscle tissue, but it's a very special, it, it does a very special task. The yeah, the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Doesn't it really so it's a storage depot for calcium. If we were able to go in and count the number of calcium molecules in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it would be billions and trillions of calcium molecules. Tons and tons of calcium inside of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So calcium entering in from the extracellular fluids can interact with the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the interaction between the calcium and the sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to take, take place specifically on channels on or of the SR causing them to open. Now these channels that open up on the sarcoplasmic reticulum are going to be calcium channels. And so now this small little amount of calcium that enters, interacts with the sarcoplasmic reticulum results in high levels, more calcium flooding into the cell. I think you should be able to take it from here. I really do. Calcium levels get super high inside of muscle cell. What happens? <laughs> Calcium begins to interact with what protein? Say bottom trout. Troponin and by interaction trophomycin. Now in this case, it's actually going to be a specific troponin. It's going to be troponin C, which stands for cardiac. So troponin C is going to be bound by that influx of calcium into the cell. And then from there, I'm not even really going to go over this in any sort of detail because once troponin C is bound, the muscle contracts. And that process of muscle contraction is the same method that we observe in skeletal muscle, which I'm just going to abbreviate as, I'll put in a little K in there, SKM, skeletal muscle. Troponin C gets bound by calcium. When it changes its conformation, it moves tropomyosin out of the grooves of the actin site. When the actin sites expose their, act their active sites, when actin molecules expose their active sites, the head of the myosin molecule can now bind up, goes through a power stroke. We have the sliding fil uh, filament theory. Sarcomere shortens, pulling on 
the uh, uh, membrane of the cardiomyocyte, shortening the whole cardiomyocyte. Yes? Do you recommend like, looking back at that process for this Absolutely. Yeah. If you don't remember how a skeletal muscle contracts, basically from the release of calcium to the, in the sarcoplasmic reticulum to shortening of the cell, you're going to want to review that because it's the same method. So we've already gone over that in detail, so I'm not going to continue to, to belabor that. Okay, now, you will remember that in skeletal muscle, we formed what we called a twitch, which was a latent period followed by contraction and relaxation. In this case, the cardiomyocytes, when they go through their contraction, The cells are going to persist uh, in their contracted state much longer. In skeletal muscle. So we actually contract them for a longer period of time. It's not just a short few millisecond twitch. Now, the explanation or the reason for that persistence in contraction is our calcium levels are going to remain increased for a prolonged period. Now, if you'll remember back to skeletal muscle physiology, what happened or what was the requirement to reduce calcium levels inside of the skeletal muscle? Do you re does anyone remember? We had to remove the nerve signal at the motor end point, right, the neuromuscular junction. As soon as we stopped releasing acetylcholine into the synaptic gap of the neuromuscular junction, calcium got picked back up into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and pushed back out into the extracellular fluid. And then muscle contraction stopped. We don't really have that nerve signal anymore. This isn't centered around acetylcholine causing the whole process to occur. We're generating autorhythmically. Auto so calcium remains in a, for a prolonged period of time. Now, exactly why this happens is really actually still a, a matter for debate uh, um, within the molecular physiology world. But it appears that there's probably two reasons, and it might actually be both of these reasons. So there are two possible reasons why calcium remains prolonged for a prolonged period of time inside of the cardiomyocyte. The first reason is that the calcium channels that are found in the sarcoplasmic reticulum are just simply slow to close. <clears throat> so they open up and they close over a prolonged period of time. So the amount of calcium that can continue to flood into the cell is elevated. A second possibility is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which the whole time it's releasing calcium, remember that we still have calcium reuptake that's occurring. So we have proteins that are bringing calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, even as a bunch of it's being released. It's kind of like that leaky faucet again. It's leaking back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum all of the time. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum could just be a lot slower in the cardiomyocyte to take back up. calcium from the intracellular fluid. So we might have prolonged release and slow uptake combining to allow calcium to remain in the cell for a prolonged period of time. As long as we have calcium inside of a muscle cell, whether it's skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle, we'll have prolonged contraction. Contraction will continue. Yes. So is that more necessary for the heart because it has to constantly contract versus like the skeletal muscle where we can 
<laughs> well, the heart, um, you, you, the heart, we don't want to just twitch. Yeah. You know, muscle. When 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 we activate a um, a nerve group, a, uh, a motor group in skeletal muscle, it just twitches if we get one impulse. We basically have one impulse here, right? We have the generation of that initial action potential in the SA. We want the heart to go through its full contraction. That full contraction is love dub. So we don't want just a little twitch. We don't want the muscles just kind of go. Eh. We want it to go and squeeze on the blood to push it through the heart. So inherent to the mechanism, yeah, we want to make sure that the muscle goes through its full muscle contraction and this doesn't give us a little twitch. Okay, so... Before I finish this up, I want to talk a little bit kind of about the timeline here. As the plateau of the action potential begins to fade, of course, this is accounted for by potassium channels that open allowing potassium to pour out of the cell. So the plateau begins to fade, potassium channels are open, potassium is pouring out of the cell. Calcium moves back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, into the extracellular fluid. And the muscle contraction soon uh, ends or relaxes. Okay? So we actually have this short amount of time after we reverted our electrical activity back down towards our resting membrane potential where muscle contraction is still kind of finishing up. So this doesn't line up. It's not like if we draw out, okay, so here's our action potential in the SA node and the signal gets passed on and right alongside our action potential in maybe the atria, which looks something like that, which looks like a one-eared Batman. Whatever the case, um, it's not like, okay, this is where the muscle contraction is occurring. Muscle contraction actually requires calcium in high levels inside of the cell. That's not really happening until the sarcoplasmic has been interacted with. And so calcium levels in the cell, I'm not talking about the, the, that we see here in the in the uh, action potential. I'm talking about the calcium levels required in high levels to cause the sarcomere contract. They're not actually being dumped in here until towards the end of that electrical activity. So in all reality, rather than it being muscle contraction during the action potential, it's actually following the action potential. So it ends after the action potential is already ended. Does that make sense? Does everybody have everything they need here? All right. Um, so you've heard the term refractory before, and you'll remember that there were two refractory periods in skeletal muscle and even in nerve signal. We had the absolute refractory period where no matter what we did, we couldn't stimulate another uh, another contraction or another signal. 
Uh, and then the other was the relative, where only a strong enough signal could cause a, another um, another action potential to form. The heart actually exhibits a 250 millisecond absolute refractory period. This is a quarter of a second. 250 milliseconds is a quarter of a second. That's a long time in terms of cellular physiology. But there's a really, really important reason for this. And I'm going to draw out a little graph here, and hopefully you'll remember what this is. Okay, so we're going to have time here on the x-axis, and then over here we're going to have force production. Okay, and we're going to bring in some stimuli here where I put the arrows. As long as those stimuli are fast enough, if this is skeletal muscle, we end up with a wave that looks very smooth. Anyone remember what we called that? So this is muscle contraction. If the stimuli come in and they're far enough apart, we just get the twitch that looks like this. If we bring them in a little bit closer, we may get twitches that build on top of each other. And then if we bring them in really, really quick, we end up with that curve there. Tetanus, I heard it. So we can tetanize skeletal muscle. What happens when you tetanize skeletal muscle? And there's no additional force that can be produced. Now let's think about the heart. What, what do we need to do in order to move blood? We need to press down on that blood. So what if the heart tetanizes and it stops its movement? We're no longer able to, to push any blood around. So we have an absolute refractory period that says these cannot happen. We, we can put in gigantic signals here, and the heart's still going to go through its contraction, and no matter how big that how big that signal is, because it's absolute, it's not going to respond. So the heart is always going to be able to contract, which is a good thing. Oh, I feel tetanus coming on. <laughs> Better take in a couple deep breaths and sit down. So because of this 250 millisecond absolute refractory period, tetanus or wave summation are unable to occur. They do not occur. And the simple reason that that's so important is because whenever we tetanize a muscle, we overly stimulate it. An overly stimulated muscle does not contract. And we need our heart to continue to contract because we need to move that blood around constantly. We can't have these great drip dips in pressure being produced. Because when we have a drop in pressure, blood flow would cease. And if we stop blood flow for a prolonged period of time, we're not oxygenating the working tissue, including the brain and the heart itself. And both of those would be uh, pretty problematic. All right, end for test one. Everything that you have now will be on the test coming up in a week from today. Now don't pack your stuff up because we're going to continue going here. So now we got an idea about the electrical activity of the heart, how we generate action potentials, and then link that action potential uh, to muscle contraction. Uh, we know a little bit about how the muscle contracts and increasing calcium levels inside of the cell. Now I want to talk about the cardiac cycle. So you basically have been looking at what's happening in an individual cell. Let's take all of these cells collectively to the whole heart and as they contract and we move that signal along the conduction system, 
what are the consequences? What are the changes that we see in things like pressure and blood flow and contraction? All of those collectively. Okay, so we're going to deal with this thing called the cardiac cycle. But to effectively understand the cardiac cycle, which just simply is a complete contraction, relaxation of all chambers. So both atria and both ventricles. Okay, so that's going to be a cardiac cycle. Heart sounds that we experience during the cardiac cycle are going to be loved up. We're going to have the blood flow, the atriums contract, and then the ventricles contract. <laughs> Love dub. But before we can really get into this, every time the, the heart contracts, we're reducing the size of the chambers, and there are some pretty uh, important physics principles that are uh, that are occurring here that are regulating this process. So before we really get into the specifics here, we have to get into some basic physics. And really I want to talk about the physics of pressure and the physics of flow. The area of physics that deals with pressure and flow is called fluid dynamics. Okay, so I have a, an example here uh, to illustrate a principle, a basic principle of fluid dynamics. And we have to spend some time de defining some of these terms. Okay, so fluid, fluids and dynamics and pressures and flow and all of this stuff. So first, let's define the term fluid. What actually is a fluid? Fluid is just simply a movement of matter. Now, matter as in terms of solids, liquids, and gases are different states of matter. Matter is anything that has mass and consumes space. Okay? Now, it's pretty hard to make solids move, so solids are not going to be fluids. But we can move liquids and we can move gases. So both liquids and gases can be considered <coughs> fluids. And we're going to move those examples of matter from place to place. Now, when we move a liquid or a gas, This process is going to be contro controlled by two variables or two factors. So basically I'm saying if I wanted to take a bottle of orange juice or a bottle of water and I wanted to move that fluid, the liquid, from one place to another, I would need to do two things to control that move. The two things that I would need to do are the two factors that are going to control the process are going to be pressure induced on the fluid. Now, when I alter the pressure, this causes the fluid to move. So this is going to be responsible for the movement of the fluid. So in the syringe here, this bottom picture, we're pushing the syringe in. And what we're doing is we're actually increasing pressure right here, pressure one. Out here in the environment, pressure two is staying constant. By increasing pressure one and allowing pressure two to maintain as a constant, we create this thing called a pressure gradient, where we have high pressure at one point and low pressure at the other point. And that's going to begin to cause... Whatever the fluid is in there, it says that it's air. Uh, I think someplace, yeah. So air flow in and out of the syringe. So air in this example of the syringe is going to be the fluid. We're changing the pressure. We're inducing pressure on the air inside of the syringe, and we're moving it from one place to another place. Okay, so pressure is going to be one of the factors that regulates the fluid flow, the fluid dynamics of 
the air in this example. The other factor is going to be resistance. Now the resistance is going to oppose fluid movement. So pressure is going to cause fluid movement. Resistance is going to oppose fluid movement. The collective nature of both of these factors results in the amount of flow that that fluid is going to experience. So consider the syringe here, down in this lower figure. I can induce a certain amount of pressure, and then the opening of the syringe is going to be the resistance. So I put a bunch of pressure in there. It's a really small opening, so a lot of resistance pushing back, so I just get a small amount of flow. What would happen if I increased the size of that syringe and I opened up the bore size significantly? Put on the same amount of pressure, there's less resistance, more air flow. Okay? So these two factors are going to interact and they're going to change the overall movement or fluid dynamic. So let's deal here just a little bit with fluid movement. So fluid movement we could define as movement from one location to another. And in order for a fluid to move from one location to another, let's say location A, we're going to have to induce higher pressure in location A to overcome the opposing resistance to move from location A to location B. But I'm also going to have to have conducive movement or conducive pressures at location B that are lower than location A. So elevating pressure at, the, at, at one location, we're going to call this location 1 or location A, and we'll call this location B or location 2. Increasing pressure at location 1 above location 2, I can overcome the resistance of the bore, of the opening, and I'll have movement from location 1 to location 2 because of the higher amount of pressure. So by adding pressure or increasing pressure at one location, the fluid at that location is going to be induced to move towards the lower area of pressure. So the fluid moves from location A to location B. Taking this just a little step further, we could say that the fluid is moving from high pressure to low pressure. From high pressure to low pressure. Now, you've actually all experienced this before. In fact, we experienced it just a couple of days ago. We had a high-pressure front that moved into Cleveland. That was the day that it was really, really windy. I think that was Monday. It was really, really windy. And the reason that was is because the fluid, which is the air, was being pushed from high pressure, as the high-pressure front came in, towards low pressure, which was to our east. And so we had wind because of the fluid movement. Taking it a step further, defining it with one single term, moving a fluid from high pressure to low pressure, it's acting within a pressure gradient. So moving from a high pressure point to a low pressure point, the fluid moves down its pressure gradient not to be confused with the concentration gradient or the gravitational gradient. This is due to pressure, not numbers of molecules, but pressure induced on the fluid. All right, so fluid pressure is actually going to be related to 
the volume that contains that fluid. So the pressure induced on the fluid is related to the container that the fluid is contained within. Let me put it just a slightly different way. Fluid pressure is inversely Make sure I spell that right. Inversely proportional to the volume of the chamber. Or you could substitute in for chamber, you could call it a container. So in this syringe, this syringe has a certain volume. It's filled up with air. The air that fills that chamber volume, if we push pressure onto it, we're going to inversely change the volume of the chamber in a known proportion. So let's draw this out just a little bit more. I got just a couple more minutes before I'm going to let you go. Yes. Can you explain Oh, I'm just saying that chamber and container, these are synonyms. You, okay. you can use the term chamber or container. Okay. Chamber is obviously going to be what we call them in the heart. The container would probably be what we would call it here in the example of the syringe. That's a container holding onto a fluid. So if we increase chamber volume, what should happen to the pressure on the fluid? It's inversely proportional. It's going to decrease. We can run that backwards too. If we decrease the fluid's pressure, we would increase, be increasing the chamber volume. And it goes on to say that if we decrease chamber volume, we result in an increase in fluid pressure. Okay, this is where I'm going to stop, but I want to, um, before we move specifically into what's going on in the heart, I want to, I want to take just a couple more seconds here to sort of um, help you to understand volumes and pressures and things like that. All right, so can I borrow your, so I have a container of orange juice and it has some orange juice in there, you can see, hopefully it doesn't spoil. So there, there is orange juice in here, all right? The container has a volume. The liquid also, we can measure that out, all right? So when we talk about the chamber volume, we're talking about the, the bottle, not the liquid inside of the bottle. So in the heart, we're talking about the atrium and not the blood inside. The blood's going to be the fluid. It does have a volume, and we can measure that volume, but when we talk about volume, we're talking about the container. So what happens if I squeeze on that container, and it's, you can see it there just a little bit, I'm reducing the volume of the chamber. I just, if, if we had this filled up with water representing how much volume is in the container, and I squeeze it, what would happen? Some of the water would squirt out because I've just reduced the volume of the container. Okay? So as we begin to go, forward here and discuss things going on inside of the heart. Thank you. The chamber is referring to the atrium and the ventricle in their overall volume. The fluid is going to be the blood, and yes, it has a volume, but when we say change in volume, we're not talking about changing the blood. I just squeezed on this. Inside of this container right now, there is a pressure, and it's related to the volume of this container. And that fluid inside is being affected by that volume. I'm squeezing now. I've reduced the container's volume. What happened to the volume of the liquid inside? It's exactly the same. I didn't change the volume of the liquid inside. But what did I do to the pressure on, side, or on, the, on the liquid? I just increased it. So in all reality right now, it's not really that noticeable. Yeah, you can't see it all that much because I'm not strong enough. 
the orange juice is actually compressing down towards the bottom of the container because of where I'm inducing the pressure. Okay, so just keep that in mind. We will pick up here with uh, heart chamber pressures on Monday.